Good evening. This is a special report on Sri Lanka's current economic crisis brought to you right here on Abdurna 24. Now, this economic crisis has been a contentious topic, of course, that we have been covering uh, very, very specifically throughout our entire program lineup. But we thought it would be better to give the viewers watching tonight a more comprehensive outlook on exactly what is happening globally and of course nationally and for that we have with us Professor Jami Mamadoud and he is the Professor of Economics at the Sarah Lawrence College Bronxville New York. Professor Jami Mamadoud is also the board member of the Association for the Promotion of Political Economy and the Law. Now of course we should probably Professor thank you very much uh, for taking the time to speak to us today and to enlighten our viewers on exactly what the current outlook is in Sri Lanka and of course globally when we consider the country in a geopolitical standpoint as well. Now let's cut right to the chase Professor. Now what is your take on the growth of the current school of economics which is neoclassical economics. Now we know that it is the most dominant f uh, form of uh, economic study that's being conducted throughout the world right now. So what is your take on the growth of this school of thought uh, that has co dominated completely the universities and educational institutions today? Thank you so much for inviting me and good evening to your viewers and good morning from here in Connecticut in the United States. Um, so that is the core question, which is um, the dominance, the intellectual dominance of a method of inquiry which is presented to um, students, both undergraduate, graduate, and a lot of the folks who, well, almost pretty much all the folks who end up in the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. Um, you know, their thinking is shaped by this view that uh, markets are uh, almost, they almost conceptualize markets in, in uh, pre-political terms, that markets are fundamentally natural in some sense. Not that they're saying that markets are like nature, but there's almost this idea that um, markets are taken as given, and then we uh, need to sort of adjust around the edges to make them more efficient. Now, this kind of thinking uh, goes back to the very ways by which students are trained, uh, oftentimes, uh, almost invariably in mainstream departments, which is they're not exposed to any other view but this particular view. Uh, and uh, the the problem is that um, uh, laissez-faire is taken as the baseline. And so my point is that it's not that, you know, before one even gets into the question of whether one likes less affair, uh, the category itself needs to be, uh, needs to be questioned. Uh, and that is unfortunately not done in the training of students. So to provide you with some kind of a context, uh, I'm currently working on a book. Uh, and the title of this book is the legal and political foundations of capitalism, uh, the end of laissez-faire question mark. And the two uh, components of the title come from, respectively, the first part comes from the famous institutional economist, uh, John R. Commons, his book, Legal Foundations of Capitalism. Uh, and the second part, the subtitle of my book is uh, the end of laissez-faire with a question mark. Now, the end of less affair without the question mark was an article, a very well-known article by John Maynard Keynes, writing during the 1920s and 1930s. Now, uh, the point that I make in this book is that uh, there's no question of ending less affair if it never even existed. Uh, and so to do that, one needs to understand analytically what uh, markets are, what property rights are, what contracts are, uh, these very categories that economists, especially neoclassical economists, take for granted. But um, they, in fact, are profoundly shaped by the underlying um, politically constructed legal foundations of, of markets. Um, so that's one thing that uh, students don't get, right? They don't, uh, they don't read, um, of course, they don't read Commons, maybe they read uh, Keynes, but again, they certainly don't read Commons. They don't even probably read Adam Smith in the original. So here's something that may be a little bit of a surprise for uh, some of your viewers. Um, the, the expression invisible hand 
is almost synonymously linked to uh, to Adam Smith, and it's uh, you know virtually uh, a commonplace in econ in economics textbooks. But if you look at Adam Smith's work, uh, you know, and the virtue of having PDFs is that you can do a very quick search. You look at the wealth of nations and um, the, uh, the his previous book, uh, the theory of moral sentiments. The expression Adam Smith appears literally once in each of those books, uh, and as many authors have pointed out, you have to understand Adam Smith to understand that you have to have read Adam Smith to have understood that Adam Smith was profoundly an institutionalist in the sense that institutions structure capitalism, institutions which are legally constructed, legally and politically constructed, they shape the relations of power in capitalism. So this would be another piece of surprise for many of your viewers, that Adam Smith was absolutely clear and unequivocal that there were unequal relations of power in capitalism. That is something that is often associated with uh, say Marx, but in fact, it was there in Adam Smith, and Adam Smith, by all reckoning, was not at all opposed to capitalism. But it was there in his work. It was there in David Ricardo, another very important uh, um, political economist of the nineteenth century. The problem is that students don't read this stuff. They don't read uh, the debates in economics. They don't do uh, economic history. So what happens is that the professionals who work at these multilateral organizations, they conceptualize economics in almost mechanical terms. And therefore, the so-called market reforms that countries like Sri Lanka are supposed to um, adopt are almost technically necessary, even if it causes some quote-unquote short-term uh, pain, for example, the rising cost of electricity that uh, or the value added taxes in your country because of the IMF deal, these are all seen as potentially temporary, which market forces will solve. And this is almost axiomatically stated by these kinds of professionals because um, it's, it's almost as though one were challenging the laws of gravity to even question uh, these kinds of um, uh, policies. Now, so what we have here is um, an issue, which is that here is a discipline which functions in a particular way that it doesn't even enter into conversation with other schools of thought in the discipline itself, leave aside the fact that it doesn't enter into any conversation with uh, other disciplines such as history or politics, because those are seen as irrelevant to this um, Professor, I would like to interrupt you there and actually ask you, Professor, now to break down the technicalities of this entire situation where, you know, the IMF is adopting a neoclassical ideology in the sense where free markets are engaged and, you know, importer dependency is also being encouraged, of course. Now, if you could break down for the layman exactly how this translates through the IMF deal to Sri Lanka's economy, if you could just let us know a little bit about what exactly goes on due to these, the repercussions, basically, of these IMF uh, restrictions, I would say. Right. So, for example, um, you take two issues, one of which is that supposedly free trade is supposed to benefit uh, countries like um, uh, Sri Lanka. And the claim is that uh, if Sri Lanka pursues free trade policies, then um, for the standard neoclassical mainstream model, um, trade will be balanced, um, which is empirically absolutely not true. If by the World Bank's own data, you see persistent trade imbalances across the world going back a very long time. Um, the other issue is this business of central bank independence, which is the, 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 the sort of the, the sort of the, the linchpin of it all, which is supposedly the central bank has to stay aloof. Uh, but again, this implies uh, a, a breathtaking, both of these two imply a breathtaking rewriting of history, which is, so in regards to uh, trade performance, 
I have no problems with the argument that Sri Lanka needs to be export competitive. For sure, it does. The question is, what does that exactly mean? And if you look at the history of capitalism, and you can look at right here, the United States, right? Um, industrial policy has been a centerpiece of uh, export promotion policies right from the 19th century. Uh, I mean, one can look to roughly your neighborhood in East Asia. Um, so that's that, uh, where South Korea and Japan and so on pursued industrial policies, um, China. Uh, so, so the fact that industrial policies are really central uh, to export promotion and competitive export promotion, that's, I've not seen that in any um, document linked to the IMF or the World Bank. Uh, and I know that uh, Sri Lanka has engaged in 15 or 16 uh, deal, uh, debt deals with the IMF since, what, 1965, something like that. Okay, the other thing is the business about the central bank, where central banks across the world, uh, you take the Bank of France, uh, bank, the Bank of France uh, was, played a very important role throughout the 19th century and then after the Second World War in selectively providing, uh, ensuring the provisioning of credit to um, a, a wide range of sectors in the economy, in, uh, you know, industry in uh, agriculture. Uh, one key aspect of that in the post Second World War period was to uh, provide uh, credit to uh, export sectors so that um, uh, France would earn foreign exchange. This happens uh, in a similar way in Germany after the Second World War, uh, in which a public sector bank a public development bank, which still exists, by the way, with union representation on it, played a very important role in uh, post-war German reconstruction development. You look at Sweden, uh, the Bank of Sweden played another very important role in electrification, housing, and so forth. So it's absolutely not correct to say that central banks stayed aloof and free markets did their thing. Uh, they were always integrated, not in a way that uh, the central banks acted as printing presses, uh, as is often characterized, but they were selectively used uh, to promote uh, export and industrialization. I think these are lessons that can be learned uh, for countries like Sri Lanka. Uh, and more specifically, I think analytically, economists in your country could learn that in fact these involved, these policies involved an understanding of how institutions, which after all are politically and legally constructed, could be uh, redesigned to at least think about alternatives to policies in your country that have just not worked, right? Sri Lanka was one of the earliest countries in the 1970s to pursue quote unquote free market reforms and it's gotten it nowhere. I see, Professor. And also now, considering the earlier point that you made, Professor, with the industrial policy and production economies, you know, how this relates to Sri Lanka, how can we practically apply such a policy into Sri Lanka? Do you believe that it can uh, keep us afloat? Well, I think there are two things over here. On a practical level, I think the first thing to understand is there has to be and maybe it already exists, so I'm not aware of that in your country, but uh, there has to be an awareness amongst policymakers, amongst economists, that in fact there's something fundamentally and deeply problematic about um, the uh, IMF policies and more, more, more deeply neoclassical economics. So that kind of intellectual training has to be there. And as I said, it may be there. We don't see it much here in the United States or in Europe. So I don't know about Sri Lanka, maybe it does. That has to be there. And, and, and that implies that um, uh, what needs to happen in Sri Lanka. So take, for example, your Ceylon Electricity Board, right? So take that as a very concrete example. Now, we know that these enormous hikes in rates um, are mandated by the IMF deal. And they have, as, as, we, as we all understand, have devastating consequences for your country, uh, 
as electricity becomes un- unaffordable and 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 this people face a cash flow squeeze having to pay their electricity bills going to debt okay fine but look surely there would have been a more intelligent way to deal with the ce which is to increase its productivity linked to a deeper strategy of industrial policy that would lower unit costs of production through mechanization technological change uh, and increasing labor productivity all of which would bring down the prices of electricity linked to a broader strategy of uh, industrialization linked to social development now again this is nothing you know this is not pie in the sky it's been done it's been done over and over again uh, and what is truly astonishing about the intellect- intellectual training of these economists at the world bank and the imf is that they seem not to be aware of these policies and so that austerity becomes the only way uh, and it's not well it's not even particularly useful at best it is dangerous it is destructive at worst that there are alternatives that we can draw on and they have existed i see professor now uh, finally i would like to ask you since you mentioned earlier uh, about uh, enterprises and the imf you know the restrictions put forward by it how do you believe these imf restrictions have affected the sme sector in sri lanka because i feel like that is the most affected right now because it's the middle level and there's a lot of pressure right now with the increasing uh, energy tariffs as well as you've mentioned so how does it correlate to the sme sector and how has it pushed the sme sector right. so in a number of different ways first of all making the cost of credit so incredibly expensive the central bank independence framework has essentially a uh, part of it part of the deal has been to keep interest rates very high which means that um, the supply of credit is constrained whereas the smes need credit by definition because they have very low cash flow uh, and you have a very small internal market in sri lanka which means that um, for these smes to grow you need they need credit and they need credit not just as giveaways and so one can think about the institutional framework behind that but certainly that that's really crucial to uh to not just keep those smes afloat but also to make them grow and i mean you have a very large informal sector in your country uh, as in other uh, countries in the global south and so that informal sector generates a lot of jobs and it is potentially capable of um uh, a lot in terms of um uh, economic development in terms of growth and all the rest of it uh so there's that the other is of course the question of uh, electricity right which is that the high rates of charges um are disproportionately going to affect those uh, those uh, firms compared to the larger firms which means that you're going to get a greater increase in inequality uh, and the austerity programs are going to lead to um yeah higher rates of unemployment or underemployment whereas i think that i mean there are two things that i think are kind of going for sri lanka one is that sri lanka has a high rate of literacy which i think is a uh, first of all that's a positive it's only for obvious reason that's a positive sign then there are certain aspects of your constitution uh i'm thinking here of uh articles 27 and article 12 article 12 is the right to equality article 27 has a whole bunch of social and economic rights types of uh, provisions in it that um there there is uh you know growing sort of use of the judiciary from what i understand in attempting to promote social and economic development and so i think this is the third part to my answer to your question which is that i don't think that we should be we should fall into this trap of thinking that well first of all we need to fix the economy then we deal with social needs because i don't think that i think that's a false dichotomy uh that was not practiced anywhere um uh, if you think about 
uh, the post Second World War period across Europe. Uh, right, for professor. example, yeah, Professor. Now there is a lot more to discuss on that specific issue that you just mentioned, especially considering energy tariffs as well, and also the fact that not all hope is lost considering our high electricity rate, among other things that we can salvage right. in our economy. Uh, but before that, let's take a very short break. You're watching this special report on other than 2024. Stay with us. Welcome back to this special report on Sri Lanka's current economic crisis. We were in conversation with Professor Jami Madhud. Now, we were just speaking about the social aspects of Sri Lanka's development and how it can contribute to economy as well, which means we can directly uh, just jump right into the biggest uh, topic, I feel like, that we can uh, discuss considering Sri Lanka's economy. Uh, Professor, I'd like to ask you about debt. So debt restructuring is a very, very controversial topic right now because there's a very polarized view on it as well with how it's being uh, gone about uh, the past few days and how what has transpired in the economic circle of Sri Lanka. So Professor, what's your take now? Debt restructuring, are we going about it the right way? Is there a, a suggestion that you could make that uh, maybe we're not uh, properly addressing the issue? Absolutely. <laughs> And the way to answer that question is very simply to say, well, let's take a look from post-war economic history. Germany, West Germany. Um, West Germany's, uh, so 19, the 1953 London Debt Agreement, 1953, cut West German sovereign debt by 50%. And as many authors have pointed out, that gave the West German government enormous breathing space to promote economic development. As far as I recall, uh, some of the signatories to that uh, to the London Debt Agreement of 1953 were actually former colonies of Britain, including, a, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Ceylon, the old name for Sri Lanka, uh, Jamaica, and others. Okay, now, uh, I think doing a deeper dive into West Germany is kind of interesting because I think it reveals a lot about what is kind of missing in the conversation. First of all, the uh, the West German government uh, and the West German people benefited from a constitution, the 1948 constitution, which is a second generation constitution, which gave a lot of um, social and economic rights that guaranteed a lot of social and economic rights. Uh, uh, and and so the uh, the model of economic development that West Germany benefited from uh, in the 1950s uh, was was actually quite unorthodox, and it is a kind of method of economic development, of social development and, and industrial development that is off the radar screen, including by the way to West uh, to German economists today who have completely forgotten or are not aware of that part of their country's history, which is that professor, that model... Just to, very sorry to cut in, Professor. I would like to actually uh, build on that. Why do you believe it is unorthodox? Well, first of all, the constitution was a second generation constitution, which guaranteed a whole set of social and economic rights. Uh, and then at the same time, um, the, uh, the, the, the Bank for Re uh, Reconstruction um, KFW, that it's a public sector bank, played a very important role in promoting uh, uh, industrial development and export-led industrialization, because obviously that was a very important, you know, the Deutsche Mark didn't have any value in those days, right? Uh, that was the old currency. So you had a model of industrial and social development. It was not, uh, you know, free trade and, um, you know, austerity. It was not at all that. Was completely the opposite of that. And the same thing goes for France, by the way, uh, in which the uh, constitution of the Fourth Republic and then the Fifth Republic, uh, the 1958 constitution, explicitly has social and economic rights, but at the same time they were woven into a policy of export-led industrialization. right? And in the case of Germany, as I said, its sovereign debt was forgiven uh, by 50%. So you have here a model of development in 
Europe's two largest economies, which today promote, you know, through the IMF and the World Bank and so on, they promote uh, the, you know, the virtues of, uh, of um, austerity and free markets when that is completely antithetical to what they themselves practiced. Uh, and that's what really was the basis of what in, in France is popularly known as the 30 glorious years uh, of uh, reconstruction and development. You looked at Japan. Again, Japan pursued a very uh, unorthodox approach, uh, but again, uh, improving living standards for large segments of the population. I think these are lessons to be learned. I'm not suggesting that um, uh, countries like Sri Lanka can just mimic uh, what has happened in the past. Of course not. But the virtue of looking at those experiences is that is that they are uh, they provide us with very meaningful ways to thinking about alternatives and of sort of pushing back against the dominant paradigm, which has the, the you know the intellectual training of the economists pushing that that dominant paradigm they probably themselves are not aware of uh this history uh and so in that sense i think uh coming back to sri lanka again the the fact that there is a viable and a sensible model of economic development that could be followed in terms of um if it were possible to reduce its sovereign debt and link that to a model of social and export-led industrialized, uh, export-led industrial development, that that is something that I think policymakers and economists and other people in your country should be talking about. Um, we should not sort of, uh, sort of seed the terrain to the view that Sri Lanka needs to be more competitive internationally and sort of say, well, okay, I, I mean, I personally have no problems with that argument, right? But I don't think that, that you're going to do that through austerity. Uh, the elephant in the room is, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the living experiences, the actual existing experiences of so many countries around the world. Uh, I'm not going to talk about East Asian countries that much South Korea, China, and so on, because those are those South Korea uh, developed under an authoritarian regime, um, and so uh, I'm not I'm not uh, sympathetic to authoritarianism. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, a truly social democratic development strategy is possible, and there are very concrete examples that one can use. Uh, and again, as I said. The Sri Lankan Constitution, Articles 27 uh, and Article, um, I think, 12, there are already provisions there. But again, this is, this is uh, you know, what I wanted to emphasize is that it's not either social development or international competitiveness. I'm saying that that's a false dichotomy that we need to break out of. I see, Professor. Now, actually, to build on the social aspect that you mentioned, that we have a, at least one strong thing going for us in our country when it comes to that, how do you believe that our somewhat bolstered social system and uh, social status, basically, how we have built, especially when you consider literacy rates and all, how can that correlate or how can that translate to a stronger economy in Sri Lanka? Do you believe that we are capable of pulling ourselves out of this crisis situation? I think one can answer that by that question by saying, well, why not, right? I mean, you know, uh, in the sense that it depends on to what extent there is a, there's a consciousness and there's a knowledge that alternatives are possible, right? First of all, uh, you know, looking back at Sri Lanka's own history, um, you know, understanding the mistakes of that history. So before the 1970s, Sri Lanka, like many other countries, pursued a model of import substitution industrialization, which in many ways perhaps were important, but also in many ways were deeply problematic because a narrow policy of protectionism uh, is not going to get a country anywhere. But successful industrializing countries, export-led industrializing countries, linked uh, the process of 
uh, import substitution to export-led industrialization. That was a strategy across the world, uh, wherever it was successful, whether you're talking about Northern Europe, whether you're talking about um, Western, uh, Central Europe, or you're talking about East Asia, right? So that is that suggests that it's important to 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 sort of rethink what we mean by industrial policy. Um, and then the second issue is, I think, coming back to your question, uh, to to debunk myths, right? So West German again, the claim that somehow. West Germany pulled itself up by its bootstraps because people just worked hard and saved hard. I mean, you know, this, this is this is not a particularly useful way of thinking about the world. First of all, West German savings rates were very low, and that's not in, in the 1950s. Not surprisingly, because it was coming out of a war shattered situation. Uh, what played a really crucial role was the role of credit in developing the export sector. Now, we have no reason to believe that Sri Lankans are any more or any less hardworking than anybody else, than the Germans were. So I don't see the issue as, well, can Sri Lanka, can the people really pull themselves up? Sri Lankans are not, are not uh, are like anybody else in the world. Of course, that depends Professor. on whether or not they understand uh, that with that high level of education, Right, Professor, I'll have to interject you there. Very sorry for interjecting you, but that's actually a point that we can go further into, especially when we're trying to correlate Sri Lanka's position in the world. So before we get into that, let's take a short commercial break. Stay with us. Welcome back to this special report. We were in conversation with Professor Jami Madud. Now, we were talking about how exactly Sri Lanka can pull itself out of this crisis. And when it comes to pulling ourselves out of the crisis, the biggest uh, solution that people seem to be touting is foreign direct investments. There is a, a contentious, you know, there is an opinion going around where, you know, without foreign direct investments, uh, we're going to go under. So now, Professor, I'd like to direct this question to you. Foreign direct investments, is it really as essential as it is being uh, proliferated right now in the current context? Is there, uh, maybe there are repercussions towards foreign direct investments? Will we really not be able to sustain ourselves without such significant foreign direct investments? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem with the argument that FDI is a snake one on for industrialization is that it is, uh, you know, it, it misses a very important point, which is, the sort of bargaining power of the government vis-a-vis -vis, uh, FDI. I mean, FDI can be beneficial. The question is, what guarantee is there that foreign companies are not going to be importing most of their inputs into the country using uh, sort of final assembly line packaging and then exporting uh, so that uh, the country is not really producing value added? Secondly, to what extent uh, is it possible for the host country government to require that uh, foreign companies outsource or insource uh, parts of the production to domestic manufacturers. Now, if that's possible, then sure, uh, to the extent where, let's say, a car is being assembled uh, in a country like, say, Sri Lanka, but over time, increased components of the car uh, are being pr produced by Sri Lankan manufacturers, then I can see uh, something coming out of that. Uh, but in the meantime, if the car manufacturer, the foreign car manufacturer, let's say Toyota, is importing most of its imported inputs, and uh, local skills are not growing in Sri Lanka, then where is the use of that? What Where is that getting Sri Lanka? If you look at, say, China, uh, which relies heavily on Sri La uh, on uh, sorry on uh, foreign investment, uh, you know, the so-called market reforms in the 1980s did not involve uh, the absence of industrial policy. They involved absolutely the centrality of industrial policy that, uh, in effect, enabled the Chinese uh, state to actually negotiate terms with foreign investors that uh, uh, 
contributed to uh, industrialization in that country. Um, now, you know, it, the, the issue is furthermore, and this comes back to the earlier point about social development, which is that uh, the, the problem with FDI leads to development uh, to the extent where you're, you're dealing with uh, uh, high levels of inequality uh, and absolutely no labor rights or very few labor rights. You've got sweatshop type operations that are the basis of attracting foreign direct investment. I don't see how that's economic development. I mean, uh, it, it just contributes to the continued social crisis that you see in countries like Sri Lanka. So in that sense, I do think that FDI could help given certain prior conditionalities which are in place. Otherwise, it's like putting the proverbial cart before the horse, the Hail Mary, so to speak, which is somehow supposed to lift you up. Uh, and I don't think that by itself that's a good strategy. All right, Professor, now let's move on. And now that we know exactly why, where we stand when it comes to foreign direct investments and how it is not the be all end all for our country, I'd like to go into the global position of Sri Lanka. Now, the China-US tensions right now are making a significant impact on the global economy. Now, could you please break down to us exactly how this affects Sri Lanka? Of course, it's affecting the entire world, but how does it specifically correlate to Sri Lanka, the US-China tensions? Well, I think that it, it puts countries like Sri Lanka, um, uh, you know, you know, puts them in a in a very difficult situation because uh, uh, so if you look at the sort of the U.S.'s role in terms of uh, its uh, hegemonic role within the multilateral institutions such as uh, the World Bank and the IMF, with all the sort of long history of failed policies that we have talked about, um, China supposedly becomes a more attractive country to to sort of borrow from. But in China, and this is not any reflection on anybody, but on, the, on China, it has its own agenda. Uh, so if the goal, for example, of Sri Lanka is to uh, develop its own indigenous manufacturing capacity, uh, China is not going to be any different than, than, um, than the U.S. Uh, unless... Uh, you know, again, I don't know enough about that, but I, unless China's sort of loan deals to Sri Lanka are not linked to <laughs> Sri Lanka importing Chinese products into Sri Lanka, if that's the case, then uh, there's very little scope for any indigenous manufacturing. Now, look, uh, part of your foreign debt is to China, but not, but I think something like, um, what is it, 50%, I think, of sovereign debt, uh, Sri Lankan sovereign debt is actually held by international bondholders of all nationalities. And so I think that's also the issue that needs to be brought into this conversation, not just the US and China thing, but also these bondholders who will who play an outsized role in shaping um, the margin of autonomy or margin of maneuver that countries especially lower down in the international hierarchy of countries have in having some kind of a an autonomous development strategy or at least a quasi autonomous development strategy and i think that there's nothing good coming out of this uh, this this uh, the, the us china situation and certainly nothing good that i can see as far as countries like sri lanka are concerned I see. And on a conclusive note, Professor, we don't have much time left. I'd like to ask you, uh, finally, now, what exactly can, what measures can Sri Lanka put in place? What more can Sri Lanka do to develop our current situation to exactly improve our current standards? What can Sri Lanka do in order to better our economy a little bit? I think that... Um as of uh, Sri Lanka is in an extremely difficult situation because of the sovereign debt, which makes it virtually impossible for this country to, um, you know, sort of get out of that. I, I do think 
that as a first step, and this is just a very modest proposal, as a first step, there has to be a widespread conversation and debate within your country about alternatives. I think that's a first step, because unless you have that, you cannot really have any alternative um, uh, alternative to the current dominant paradigm. And I think that's where, uh, you know, I wish I could tell you that here is the recipe for now, but you cannot have a recipe unless you can figure out what the ingredients are. And if those ingredients are actually making you sick, then you need to rethink the ingredients to whatever it is that you're trying to make. And I think that's my, you know, sort of parting word of advice um, uh, to this conversation. All right, Professor, thank you very much for that very comprehensive discussion that we have just held thank right so now. Much. Unfortunately, the time has come against us. Uh, I really hope to join you once again in yet another discussion so we can bring to our viewers another comprehensive analysis of exactly how Sri Lanka can develop itself and get out of its troubled situation. Thank you very much for your time, Professor. That's all we have for you, you tonight. So that's all we have for you tonight you. on this special presentation uh, on Sri Lanka's current economic crisis and the way forward. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night.